evening. My name is Barnabas T. Gravedigger, and I am the caretaker of Dorchester Cemetery. Things can get a little dead around here, and to pass the time, I enjoy reading spooky stories by candlelight in the crypt that I call home. It's not safe to be out after dark, and you can see the sun is beginning to fade. I'd best be getting inside while there's still time. Of course, you're welcome to join me, won't you? Welcome to Dead End Dorchester, where the dead have tales to tell. Welcome, welcome to my home. My name is Barnabas T. Grave Digger, at your service. The T stands for the. What do you want? I'm on a budget. And I am the caretaker here at Dorchester Cemetery. Now, my duties include keeping up the grounds and keeping in our residence. You see, every now and again, you know, not even really now and again, not that often, it's not so long. But, but now and again, a few of our more feisty guests tend to wake up and go prowling about to cause a bit of mischief. And that's when my job really begins. But to pass the time, I enjoy reading spooky stories by candlelight here in my crypt that I call home. Now, some of you may be wondering why I've taken up residence in such a dank and dreary and dismal place such as this, and I tell you, I ask myself that quite often, in fact. But no, the fact of the matter is that I used to live in the house up on the hill over there. Well, the, um, the house that used to be on the hill over there, until the night the lightning struck it, and the thing went right up like a Roman candle, didn't it? <laughs> Look just like the 4th of July! <laughs> so as I was saying, I enjoy reading spooky stories by candlelight. And that's why I've invited all of you here this evening. To enjoy some of the stories that I have to tell. Because these stories are not my own. Not that long ago, just a couple of years back maybe, a gentleman came to our cemetery, a writer, who said he wanted to interview some of our more prolific guests and compile their stories into a book series. He would take a few liberties, of course, as would necessarily be done, but he would transform their tales into short stories and poetry into books that are perfect for reading around a campfire or on a stormy night such as this. These books are called Dead End Dorchester and as of this evening there are two different volumes available. One and two. Go figure. And they are coincidentally also available for purchase on Amazon.com. Wink, wink. Now these books were written by a gentleman whose name eludes me at the moment, however that's not important. In fact, we will be reciting a few passages from his book, Dead End Dorchester, Volume 2, 
And uh, let's take a look here who wrote this. This would be, uh, uh Mr. Seth Carney. Hmm. Never heard of him. However, be that as it may, we are going to recite a couple of passages. Now, I wanted to begin at the beginning with a bit of poetry. Well, seems like the storm's picking up now, doesn't it? As I was saying, I want to begin with a bit of poetry. Now, the very first tale we are going to be spinning is very near and dear to my heart. You see, I, Barnabas T. Grave Digger, at your service, go forth every year on October 31st, Halloween. I go forth out into the world to find the most hideous pumpkin that I can. I want the most grotesquely deformed, freakish gourd that you could ever imagine. And why? Because I will take that pumpkin and I will bring it home and I will cut it open and then rip out the guts and then bake the seeds at, you know, 250 for about 15 minutes with a bit of garlic salt. It's delicious, really. But then I will carve a terrifying jack-o'-lantern face into that pumpkin. I do this because every pumpkin deserves a place at Halloween. Whether it's a pie or a jack-o'-lantern, it doesn't matter. They all have their place. Although many get left behind and forgotten just because they didn't look like the others. I've come to learn in my time that pumpkins are a lot like people. They come in different shapes, different sizes, different colors even, but they're all really the same. And that's why I bring that pumpkin home every October 31st. I carve it, and I lovingly put it right outside the door of my crypt with a candle inside. And that brings us to the first poem of this evening. It is titled, The Jack-O-Lantern Grin. Thought I heard something. The Jack-O-Lantern Grin. Sitting there on fire, as if full of sin, I smile as I see you with your Jack-O-Lantern Grin. Guiding the way for kids out for tricks or treats. They see you from the road as they march along the streets. Your smile and your glow show it's a friendly spot for kids to get some candy in the sacks that they have brought. You are a symbol of Halloween and the trappings that it spins. For we all know it's safe to go where the jack-o'-lantern grins. I just love that story. Sounds like that storm is picking up pace now here, isn't it? We best be getting along here in our stories. We're gonna jump from poetry to the short stories, the actual tales right now. And I must give you a warning about this one. It involves something that many people do not like. I'm speaking, of course, of insects, bugs, the little creepy crawlies. Now this story is entitled, They Came From The Drain. Charlie was getting ready for bed, and while brushing his teeth, he noticed something a little strange. 
there was a spider crawling out of the sink drain. It was a little black spider that almost looked lost. Without hesitation, he grabbed a tissue from the box on the back of the toilet tank lid. As quickly as he had snatched the tissue, his fingers swooped in and squished the spider in the paper. He felt highly satisfied with his efforts and went on to finish his nightly routine. While rinsing off the brush, another odd thing took place. Charlie saw a millipede crawl out from the faucet and land directly on his toothbrush. Ooh. With a slight scream and a jerk of his hand, the millipede scurried off of the brush and went straight up the sleeve of his nightshirt. The next step was just what you might think would happen. He began roughly slapping himself all over his upper torso. The personal beating continued until he had had enough confidence that the bug had been killed. His mission was a glowing success as far as he was concerned. The millipede was dead, and he was sure of it. Charlie found himself standing in the middle of the bathroom with his heart slightly racing. After assessing the situation, his body gave one last shudder. After composing himself, the decision was made to take a brief shower. As was typical, he turned on the shower controls before undressing. Stepping into a cold shower wasn't one of his pleasures, so he let the hot water run for a minute. Once in the shower stall, Charlie took a bar of soap from the plastic caddy that was suction cup to the wall. His first order of business was to wash the area where he had killed the millipede. However, he soon discovered that the pest wasn't there. The insect had disappeared, leaving behind no trace of blood, body, or bug juice. Charlie found that to be fairly peculiar, but he brushed it off just the same. He reasoned that the millipede must have simply rubbed off on his shirt. When taking it off, he hadn't noticed if it was there or not. He found some relief in that thought and carried on with his shower. As he was replacing the soap back into the caddy, he dropped it. Turning his gaze to the bottom of the wash tub, his eyes were met with more than just a bar of soap. He began to panic as a horde of insects trickled out of the shower faucet and up from the drain. Every type of vermin imaginable was represented in the group. Spiders, both large and small, caught his attention first. Then it was followed by fire ants, pill bugs, wasps, worms, crickets scorpions, and many more that were scurrying along. The bugs all darted for his feet, rushing up his exposed legs. He kicked and screamed, reaching down to try and brush the critters off. As he did, his center of balance was thrown off, putting too much weight to his backside. He tried to regain his balance, but it was already too late. Charlie fell backwards out of the tub, through the shower curtain, and introduced his head to the toilet bowl. The impact was so great that it caused him to see a bright flash of white. An assumption could be made that he had received a massive concussion. The blow sent him into a daze that caused the room to spin. 
Unable to speak, much less stand, Charlie just laid there. The bugs from the shower were still climbing over his naked body, but he was too distorted to care. By that point, the insects were scattered into every conceivable area of his body. Yes, that also includes those spots that no one would ever want them to go. A warm and wet feeling began to seep down the side of his head and the back of his neck. Although Charlie was nearly comatose, he could still feel the blood streaming down his skin. The army of insects marched along his abdomen, covering him like a shroud of phobias. He began to come around as his eyes stopped twitching. Opening them as wide as he could, he was faced with the bottom side of the toilet bowl. The direction of his stare was straight up, looking at the edge of the seat rim. It was difficult for Charlie to move his head. In fact, it was almost impossible. That's when the pain set in, and he knew, beyond any doubt, that the fall had broken his neck. All of his appendages were limp on the bathroom floor, unable to even flinch. The only muscular functions that he still had available were all confined to his shoulders. Looking up didn't matter though, since there was nothing to see. Tilting his eyesight downward to his chest, he saw the first glimpse of the insect platoon. Cicadas, blowflies, cockroaches, and centipedes led that prey. Most of the leeches, slugs, and sea worms had lagged behind so much that he could hardly see them. It was just as well, because their yellow-green slime trails were rather revolting. A large group of beetles had found refuge in his throat by burrowing deep into the soft skin. He wished that he could scream, but found it difficult to do so. In order to scream, he would have to open his mouth. With a mass of insects quickly moving toward his face, an open mouth was not an option. At least in that moment, it wasn't. Unable to move and unable to scream, his eyes started to fill with tears. Shock began to take over, which brought him a sort of morbid sense of entertainment. <laughs> As he lay motionless on the bathroom floor, Charlie started giggling to himself. He had done a lot of idiotic things in his younger years, but always came out on top. The chuckles that he produced were out of fear, as well as the ridiculousness of his situation. He never could have imagined the current scenario playing out. After all, he had rolled a car in a drag race, been hit by a truck while crossing the road and was also electrocuted once. Those things could not stop him, but a few bugs caused him to break his neck and question the final outcome. The squirming mini-monsters continued to flow steadily from the shower faucet and drain. All of their thousands of legs were crawling over most of Charlie's exposed skin. From the corner of his eye, he noticed they were also pouring out of the sink. The basin couldn't contain them as they shimmied over the edge and began dropping to the floor. Many of the diminutive creatures had reached his head, though not spreading to his face. 
The insects sprawled throughout his still wet hair, the tiniest of them creeping inside of his ears. The sound was something new, yet also terrifying. Imagine the noise that some people make when chewing with their mouths open. The insect in his ear canal sounded much like that, only grittier. Charlie had never been a big fan of bugs, but he had no idea why. He thought that perhaps it could have been a sort of foreboding in anticipation of his current predicament. Or maybe this attack was all of his own making. Revenge from within the ranks of the insect world. Conceivably, they were seeking vengeance for all of the critters that he had killed throughout his lifetime. Maybe all of the little murders that he had committed were leading to this very moment. I uh, thought I heard something. I've got to keep an ear sometimes, you know. Oh, uh, well, where were we here? Ah, uh, see how the... Perceivably seeking vengeance for the critters he killed or the murders he committed. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That thought was fleeting, though, when the pests came wriggling onto his face. Charlie already knew they were covering his body. He could see that by gently tilting his head. The insects around his face certainly made their presence known, although they didn't bother him much. Of course, they were annoying, but not as bad as he thought they'd be. The insects had no real influence on him, one way or the other. Well, other than the tiny ones that clambered into his ears. Those troubled him a bit, but they weren't his top priority. All of the nasty little buggers on his face began filling in, row by row and inch by inch, until only his eyes, nostrils, and mouth remained. Charlie did a fair job at keeping the open areas of his face closed. He gritted his mouth shut so hard that he could feel some of his teeth cracking. Scrunching his nose as if smelling a remarkably foul odor helped to block his sinus passages. He squinted his eyes tightly shut and also held his breath until his lungs felt like they might burst. The rationale there was that he would be okay because the bugs would get bored and move on. That's when he heard the toilet seat lid give a little bounce and slap as it hit the rim. It was just a quick bang, but was definitely noticeable. He struggled to keep his eyes shut and was quickly running out of air. The lid popped again, only that time it hopped three or four times and then just stopped. The sound of the reverberated splashing rang out clearly from within the toilet bowl. Curiosity finally got the better of him, much to his dismay. All of the sounds that he was hearing were highly confusing, and so he opened his eyes. By that point, there was an ocean of insects scurrying out of the toilet. They proceeded to journey down the base of the porcelain bowl, heading directly for Charlie's face. His eyes grew nearly to the size of ping pong balls, and he let out an incredible scream. It was a deep and authoritative growl mostly out of desperation to keep them back. He gasped for air, only to create an even bigger problem. 
While Charlie attempted to breathe, he made the mistake of leaving his mouth open for too long. There was another attempt to scream, yet it was quickly silenced. Those bugs on the toilet charged onto his face, filling in his eyes and nose with maggots and dung beetles. He inhaled deeply to scream, but as he did, more of the jittering bugs filled his gaping oral cavity. Charles Vincent was found a few days later, still lying on the floor. Apparently, his apartment neighbors called the police, requesting a wellness check. They noticed he hadn't picked up his mail despite his car being in the parking lot. There was also a pungent smell coming from within his suites. The responding officers on the scene were greeted by the corpse of a young man. The body was laying face up on the bathroom floor, completely naked and covered in bugs. He had a broken neck, a split cranium, and was beginning to rot from the summer heat. The medical examiner's autopsy report officially listed the cause of death as accidental. For all intents and purposes, that's exactly how the scene would have looked to anyone. Nonetheless, it begs the question of whether Charlie would have agreed with the pathologist's report. The whole ordeal could have simply been a tragic accident, and nothing more. After all, these things might happen to anyone at any time. Yet in this case, the truth was only known to the two parties involved, Charlie and the Buds, but neither were talking. That sound means it's time for good old Barnabas T. Grave Digger at your service to be getting to work. You best all be getting home too and be safe on your way. Remember, it's not safe to be out after dark. I can probably take care of those few, but there will be more, much more. So go forth. Thank you for joining me this evening. And until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood Barnabas T. Grave Digger, caretaker of Dorchester Cemetery, reminding you to always keep the fun in funeral. Good evening. <laughs>